Hello, everyone, and welcome to New Consciousness Review. I'm Miriam Knight, and our guest today is filmmaker Frank Huguenard. Frank graduated from Purdue University with a B.S. in computer science and then moved to Silicon Valley, where he was a product engineer for over 20 years. Now, about 12 years ago, he lost his job while his best friend and soulmate was losing her battle to cancer. Trying to make sense of his grief and bewilderment, he set out on a spiritual journey to understand the nature of reality and why so many people on this planet are suffering. This search ignited in him a passion to share with the world the knowledge that he acquired and led to his becoming a filmmaker. Frank recently completed a trilogy of documentaries on science and spirituality called Beyond Me, Beyond Belief, and Beyond Reason, which we will have the pleasure of exploring today. So welcome, Frank. I'm so delighted to speak with you. Thank you so much for having me on today, Miriam. You know, it sounds like you had a real dark night of the soul after your partner died and your whole world fell apart. What had been your spiritual background up until then? Well, I had always, um, I, you know, I've had a, a long history of uh, psychic experiences. And, and other experiences I had, I remember being in grade school, school in the classroom having experiences that I actually never really talked to anybody about because they were, you know, they were hard to describe for one. And for two, you just, I, I didn't want people making fun of me or whatever. Um, I had grown up Catholic, but I had, uh, you know, I was. I had a paper route when I was uh, ten or twelve years old, and me and my brother were delivering newspapers. And I remember having this flash that he had his hand mauled by a dog. And uh, you know, I saw him ten or fifteen minutes later, and sure enough, you know, he he had there was a great big Great Dane or something that that mauled into his arm, and we had to take him to the hospital. And I had a long history. Um, for the last 50 years of precognitive dreams and other experiences that were, you know, verified, right? You know, you have an experience mm -hmm. and you see the truth later and it's 100% exactly what you saw. So, um, you know, I've always felt that there was something more than just our physical reality. And um, through my entire life, I had always sort of dabbled with meditation or um, you know, that sort of thing, but nothing, any, I didn't really get into anything formal until about 10 or 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. So how did this uh, kind of lifelong quest develop into the mission that you're pursuing today? <laughs> right. And, um, you know, who knows who I was in previous births that led into this too. Um so, you know, my whole world collapsed, uh, you know, a dozen years ago. I, the, the reason I had gotten fired is basically I had invented a product uh, that was functionally the equivalent of Skype. And uh, it even had YouTube functionality built into it. And uh, it was my seminal work. It was really genius. And uh, And you and I both know that going from a functioning prototype – um, to getting purchased for $3 billion, which is what Skype did. You know, you have to have everything go right. You have to have a lot of luck and, and all these things. It wasn't so much that I lost out on the, the financial end of it, but it was my seminal work. And I, had, you know, I knew that it was genius and, you know, it was really gratifying for me to develop such a great product. Um, and then to be escorted out in, in the company I was working at, they thought it was a stupid idea and a waste of company resources. <laughs> um, yeah, I know, huh? You know, Skype got bought for three billion. YouTube got bought for three billion. And I got escorted out the door. <laughs> uh, and you know, this is you know, this is going on exactly. Well, like when I'm developing this product, all this these genius ideas were coming to me while my friend was was going through chemotherapy and radiation and surgery and and convalescing all this stuff. So, um, yeah, it was brutal. Um, and then after that, you know, I had a few years of just, just misery, right? Just, you know, uh, not a happy camper. And eventually, um, you know, I, I had tried all kinds of different things in the past, and I eventually just decided, well, I'm just going to uh, dive into, you know, a med meditation practice, um, you know, with with, with some per perseverance and some determination. And, you know, you hear so much about meditation from just about everyone who has any kind of spiritual practice or spiritual orientation. 
Why do you think meditation um, is so effective in moving us essentially along our path to something deeper? Um, the way I, I, I like to describe it is you can imagine your mind or our minds as as a body of water. Uh, and bodies of water, you can imagine a perfectly still lake f- uh, first thing in the morning with, you know, without a single wave on it. Or you can imagine, you know, the ocean in, in the middle of a hurricane or a big storm. Um, and if you had to guess where humanity's collective minds and individual minds are right now, they would be more on the end of the Katrina. You know, they're big storms, lots of uh, tension. In our minds, a lot of chaos, a lot of disturbances and turbulence. And when you meditate, what you do is you take your mind and you calm it and you quiet it down so it gets to the point of that very peaceful, placid lake. And that process, even though it may only be, you know, you might meditate for an hour and you may only get into that really, really calm, perfectly calm state of mind for five minutes, but that process after a number of years and Sometime ultimately starts calming your mind down in a, in a much bigger way, and it, and it also has the effect of calming the other minds around you. Right through entrainment or something. Yeah, actually, the o- ocean is a great metaphor because if you think of the ocean, um, great storms on the surface, and yet you go down into the depths, and there is virtually no movement at all. So um, it really is a uh, an almost mapping of what happens with our brain, the surface brain versus the subconscious. Great, right, right? And that's exactly right. And all the all the all the stuff that makes up our misery really is just at the periphery. It's just mm-hmm. very superficial stuff that, once you remove it, you can come out of it very happy. Yeah. So tell me about your documentary series. You've got three films. Um, the first one was Beyond Me. What was that about? Uh, so Beyond Me is about, um, you know, I had, after just four years of meditation, I began to have these really great, blissful, divine, joyful meditations every day for an hour, two hours, three hours. Um, and I was kind of blown away. It's like, wow, you know, this is such an awesome experience. And it's a... You know, it's a birthright. You know, this is a state of consciousness that we're all imbibed with if we knew how to nurture it and cultivate it. And so initially I had just written a manuscript called Beyond Me that I never published. And, um, you know, I'd work on it and work you know, off and on for a few years. And then I finally just decided one day to take all my software engineering background. Uh, and uh, it turns out that, at least for me, making a documentary film was a lot like writing software. You know, the tools and the way you break things down into components and modules. And so, uh, you know, I, I basically about three and a half years ago, I just woke up one morning and decided, okay, I'm just going to make a documentary film. And then from that moment um, on, it took eight weeks before I, I released the film on the Internet. And that wow. film, yeah. <laughs> And I did all that. In fact, I did all three of my films without any training, background, experience, or money. I, you know, I basically did them with my own funding, which wasn't very much. Um, I did all the editing, the narration, the post-production, pre-production, filming, everything myself. Uh, beyond, but, but talk about <laughs> jumping in the deep end. Oh, well, that's kind of sort of how I roll in, lo- in a lot of different things. I mean, that's how I came up with the Skype-like product. You know, I just like, okay, I just I'm just going to go do this. Um, but to answer your question, Beyond Me really goes into, uh, you know, the mechanism of evolution and uh, reincarnation and how everything that we see in nature, if you look at the behaviors of animals, the traits and tendencies that def- sort of defines our natural world, all that knowledge that goes into how salmon spawn and bears hibernate and how leaves uh, change color in the fall, all everything in nature, it, there's intelligence, there's knowledge behind it all. And all that knowledge uh, has been carried forward uh, for billions of years through a mechanism of reincarnation. And all of the traits and tendencies that make up 
human personality disorders and all the things that really makes us miserable uh, are all they're no different from animal instincts it's basically the same thing it's the same underlying mechanism that's gone into it you know the the you, certainly your mother and your father and uh you know your upbringing has a lot to do with your personality but in the grand scheme of things it really pales in comparison to the last 100,000 years or 200,000 years of of for, the forming of your consciousness and so the case is made and beyond me for how through the art of meditation, you're able to remove those impressions that have been made on your lifetime, I mean, on your consciousness over many lifetimes, and thereby, uh, you know, bringing to an end the traits and tendencies that have gotten us into uh, so much trouble over the years. So, uh, in in essence, Beyond Me focuses on uh, what one of your swamis uh, refers to as the instinctual level. And then he goes on to the rational level. Would that be your second film? Uh, the third film, the, this, the second film is on the beliefs because so many people on this planet are entrenched in our belief systems. And that goes everywhere from everywhere from a scientist to an atheist to a, a Christian or any other religious person. They, their whole life is bound by beliefs. Um, and so belief systems are, are a hurdle that most of us need to cross to get to the truth. And ultimately, we need to get beyond the uh, reasoning, the intellectual mind. Mm-hmm. And that is carried through in your third film, which is Beyond Reason. So Beyond Beliefs um, lays out the, the the very different beliefs that we all have and the barriers that they hold to actually opening our minds to seek the truth. And, and it's not a million miles away from the theme of your third film, Beyond Reason. Uh, how do you distinguish the two films? What what was your your focus on each of them? Beyond Belief initially went into, in fact, I say it at the end of the film, that belief systems become sort of like jail cells. I mean, once you once you start believing something, uh, you stop seeking the truth because you've already found it. Um, and the case study that I use, uh, which predominantly covers most of Beyond Belief, is the narrative of uh, the story of Jesus Christ. And it goes into depth about, um, you know, there's 18 missing years in the Bible, and we're led to believe that he spent those 18 years, um, you know, building furniture in his father's carpentry shop. Uh, whereas there's a significant amount of compelling evidence that suggests that actually during those 18 years he did travel to India. He studied with some of the great swamis of the time, and uh, he brought these this great knowledge from India back to Jerusalem. And he freaked everybody out said, because it was such a radical teaching at the times that they attempted to assassinate him. And then uh, the shocking conclusion of the film is that actually after the crucifixion, which according to the Bible, we all know he was alive and, and how he got to be alive afterwards, I kind of leave that as a, you know, as a wonder, you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but apparently, um, accord, again, according to amount of, amount of significant evidence, uh, he then traveled back to India and he lived in India until he was you know, nearly a hundred years old. So the most of the film covers these sort of uh, this alternative narrative of Jesus's life, and how um, you know most of our, especially in the West, most of our belief systems are um, skewed from another potential reality. I thought it was fascinating in that film that you um, have footage of this tomb in India, which is uh, Isa's tomb, uh, which shows um, his feet with uh, holes in them. Uh, Right. This is in Srinagar at the the Rosabal uh, Shrine in Kashmir. Um, And unfortunately, this isn't an area of the world right now that's controlled by Muslims, and they're not too uh, anxious to have... uh, in spite of the fact that in the Quran it actually says that Jesus survived the crucifixion, mm-hmm. um, but they're not too anxious to have uh, Westerners or Hindus, especially, go into this shrine, take DNA evidence, or look for any other artifacts that might indicate uh, what's going on there. 
Um, but yeah, this, there's, um, like I said, there's a great deal of, of, of evidence that points to Jesus, um, staying in India until he was, one record shows him being there until he was 115 years old and being married at the age of 85 to a lady named Miriam. It's not, um, uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, and having one child, uh, the king at the time of Kashmir, of what is now Kashmir, um, wanted him to be taken care of and said, well, you should take a wife. Uh, so there's, there's all these, you know, stories, there's a great deal of evidence. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a, there's a burial, um, tomb there where he, where allegedly he was boy, uh, buried. So much fascinating stuff in that film. So then you came to your, your latest film or the closing film of the trilogy, uh, Beyond Reason. Let's talk about that. Sure. So, um, beyond reason, um, you know, the, the first film took me eight weeks start to finish. The second film took me eight weeks start to finish. And the third film took 18 months. <laughs> it took me a long time to, uh, you know, it was much more ambitious as far as from a, a filmmaker standpoint. I did a lot more interviewing of people. I traveled to India. I traveled to Canada and all over the U.S. filming people. And over that 18 months, the, the texture and the substance of the film and the content changed quite a bit from where I started off with. But ultimately, it settled on uh, an examination of what the word science actually means, um, where the word science came from, how science has evolved over the last 5,000 years uh, into something 400 years ago known as the modern scientific method, which has its benefits as well as its uh, hindrances. And it really takes a deep look at how quantum mechanics and uh, Einstein's theories of relativity really sort of destroy the underpinnings of the modern scientific method, of which is basically observability, independent verification through observability. And, uh, and really to try to make the case that Obviously, I've had psychic experiences in my life that, to me, were 100% verified. You know, time and time again, I there, I had proof that what I had, the vision, it was actually absolutely what had happened. And yet, science can't even begin to approach examining those types of things because they're beyond the physical world. They're beyond what you can measure and observe in a laboratory through peer-reviewed and uh, independent analysis. Um, and so the basic... Um, footnote there is that all the great questions that mankind has, you know, which is, who am I? Where did I come from? What's the purpose of life, the meaning of life? Is there a, a, an intelligence guiding the entire universe? Is there a God? Is there life after death? Is there reincarnation? All these really, really the most Im more important and salient questions that man ever has had are all questions that science can't ever possibly answer. And so the the film really makes the, case, the, the question or the case, is there another science apart from the modern scientific and, uh, uh, method that can address these questions and give uh, satisfactory answers to? And the, the punchline of the film is, yes, there is another science, and you can, you can get the answers to these questions. It put me in mind of that quote from Blaise Pascal, who said, the heart has its reasons, which reason knows nothing of. We know the truth not only by the reason, but by the heart. Is this what you had in mind when you called your film Beyond Reason? Uh, it, that's exactly that's exactly it. Um, I have so many conversations and debates with scientists or atheists and, uh, you know, about the irrational, you know, about things beyond the rational mind. And in spite of the fact that inside of the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle and quantum mechanics and the collapse of the wave function, or what's going on inside of black holes, both of both of which both limits of which the modern science not only can't explore but they're completely irrational. Any scientist or atheist you talk to will stop when you start to get irrational. And there's something in mathematics, in higher mathematics, called imaginary numbers. The square root of negative one, for example, being an imaginary number. The square root of negative one doesn't make any sense, which mm -hmm. just means there, you, can't, you can't have it. It just doesn't exist. And yet, 
scientists are quite happy to embrace the square root of negative one, which is an irrational number. There's so many different mathematical equations that could never have possibly been solved without irrational numbers, without factoring in the square root of negative one into the equation. And they're quite happy to say, sure, okay, we can use this. It helps us solve the equation. But if you said the same thing to them, well, we can use reincarnation to solve so many different equations in the psychological world, well, you're just being irrational, or that's pseudoscience. It's it's kind of a uh, um, a contradiction, a, a hypocrisy of scientists that, that they, on one hand they can use irrational numbers when they need to. <laughs> now it's quite funny once you realize and you point this out to them, and they'll they'll try to argue, well, blah blah blah. But no, um, yes. the, there, there's a there's a great line I use in the film as well, and this comes from um, a few different sources. But our intellects are limited. There's a a, a bound. Our, they're bound by our perceptions. You mm-hmm. can't think of something that you haven't perceived. And our perceptions are limited by our five senses, and from what we've gained, the knowledge we've gained through quantum mechanics and relativity, what we're getting through our five senses is actually more unreal than it is real. In other words, our intellects can only take us so far. And in order to get to the ultimate truth, we need to go beyond our intellects or beyond reason. Yeah, or as they say, down the rabbit hole. I thought it was fascinating the way you had this juxtaposition between um, uh, several scientists on the one hand and uh, three swamis on the other side. And there kept on being this crossover where the um, the swamis were talking science and consciousness and rationality, and the scientists were talking consciousness and universe, and and it, it was just such a perfect interweaving of and, and really exposition of the uh, the blurred lines between the two. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, it was really. I, like I said, it was an 18-month struggle to put it together. And, uh, you know, at one point I was just ready to throw in the towel. And uh, and I was, you know, fortunate enough, it was a stroke of, of luck to run into Kenny Felder, who's really the star of the film. He's a brilliant man. Um, actually, he's a high school teacher of all things. And if, if you say that, you know, I actually I asked him about it after after I filmed him, you know, and he's like, yeah, you know, I don't know what to do about that. It turns out that actually he graduated college started a software company, sold it to Microsoft for millions of dollars. And, you know, it's just a, guy, a great guy who gives back to the community and he happens to be a high school teacher. Uh, but in any event, he's quite brilliant. And once I was able to film him last year, uh, then I was able to go and finish the film. And, uh, you know, I guess the point that, that, that you've come across and you're highlighting here is that, um, you know, the word science itself comes from the Latin word scient. And, uh, you know, in many traditions, God's meant to be omniscient. And the shint in omniscient is the same root. It's the same word, the Latin root. And so, and it means that God is all knowing. And so the real meaning of the word science, and science has been around for, like I said, five, 10,000 years. It's always been there. When you're five years old and you pick up an acorn, and you wonder, how does that huge, enormous tree grow from something so small? Or you ask, why is the sky blue? Or, you know, or why do the leaves change colors? Anybody who asks those questions and wants an answer, wants the truth to any question, they're a scientist in the truest sense of the word. And so a Swami, somebody who spends his whole life investigate, investigating uh, the absolute truth, is in many respects much more of a scientist than somebody in the laboratory studying chemical reactions, which are all based on the ephem- ephemeral world. Um, and that's the that's the case I attempted to make in this film. It's like, okay, whose truth are you looking for? Whose form of science? When someone says to me, well, that's not scientific. You know, my question is, well, whose version of science are you talking about? I mean, this is almost like a Christian person talking to a Muslim and saying, my God's better than your God. I mean, it, it's really no difference when someone says, that's not scientific. Well, that's not God. My God's in the Bible. Well, you know, the, the scientists are are very similar to religious people in their dogma and their belief systems. Now, in a sense, scientists are pursuing their inquiries with one hand tied behind them because they are bound 
by the constraints of the scientific method, whereas the Swamis, um, particularly uh, in, the, the, in those involved in the Vedanta um, discipline, tradition. if you will, tradition, um, have no such constraints other than um, seeking the truth. Um, and, and at the end of the day, uh, the truth is a very subjective thing, isn't it? <laughs> well, this, that's, a, <laughs> that's probably the deepest question I've ever been asked. Um, the truth is a subjective thing. Uh, there's something called, there's a few different uh, lineages of Vedanta. Uh, but the, the, you, most people, when they say Vedanta, they mean Advaita Vedanta, which is non-dual. They don't even just say one, not, you know, a singularity, because when you say singularity, it implies more than one. So not, Advaita means non-dual, which means there's just one. There's just the self. And so if there's just the self and you become self-realized, is that a subjective experience or an objective experience? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. That's a great question, and you can just wander on that. In fact, if you just wondered on that question, you'd probably just become enlightened if all you do is just wonder about that. Um, scientists are very much, and in fact, I would say not only are they bound by the scientific method itself, but they're highly uh, bound by a combination of their reputation and academia, mm -hmm. you know, where they can't, there's a lot of scientists who might say something to me off the record uh, when I'm doing my film, but they would never say anything in front of the camera that veered anywhere outside of this, the bounds of the mind or scientific method, because it would be the end of their career, um, which is, you know, rather unfortunate. And a lot of, uh, you know, my brother's a scientist at Stanford and you know, to me, he doesn't even he doesn't even approach uh, going outside of the the lines. Uh, mm. My experience with him is that he's just so bound by the method itself; uh, he doesn't look any further than the physical world. And I know a lot of scientists are like that, and a lot of them are willing to look outside the lines, but never never actually talk about it, and maybe never even experiment with it because it doesn't. It, it's not going to yield any results that are meaningful to Scientific America or any other peer-reviewed journal that they want to publish in. Or to their career advancement. Absolutely. Um, let's hope that your film actually gets uh, some uh, viewers among this community. I understand that it's up for a People's Choice Award. Congratulations. Yes, thank you very much. And by the way, speaking of which... Uh, I did want to make sure people understood and knew that my films are, uh, you know, I made them at my own expense and they're available on the internet for free. And if you just visit my website, uh, beyondmefilm.com, or if you just go to Google and, and search for Beyond Me Frank, you'll find my website. It's the first thing that comes up. And, um, you know, the films are there for free. They're thought-provoking and profound and if you like them, uh, feel free to pass the link along to friends and family and colleagues. Um, you know, that's, that's what they're for. And if you have a slow internet connection or just want to uh, get a copy of uh, the movies on DVD for a $35 donation, which all the proceeds will go towards my next film, which is going to be Beyond Thought, I'm going to explore the nature of... Uh, of thought, where are, where do thoughts originate? Do they originate in the brain? What's the brain's function or role when it comes to consciousness, thought, perceptions, etc.? So th um, this is a real passion with you, Frank. How did you manage to fund the film? Because from my understanding, filmmaking is a fairly expensive hobby. Um, you know, I <laughs> one thing I've discovered is that when you, and I do believe this, when you... Um, you know when you're doing when you're when you're spreading this kind of knowledge and you're doing it altruistically um you're taken care of um the films didn't cost i mean beyond me probably cost a hundred and fifty dollars to make um, <laughs> beyond, <laughs> beyond that was mostly gas money same thing with beyond believe going around and filming myself yeah I already had the camera and okay the camera was a few hundred dollars um Beyond Reason cost a few thousand dollars because I had, like I said, I traveled to India and I was much more ambitious on 
you know, really wanting to search out and seek both um, spiritual scientists as well as quantum physicists and really, you know, take that really blurry edge between science and spirituality and make it even more blurry, you know. And um, so that cost a few thousand dollars, which, uh, you know, again, comes from donations through my website and, uh, you know, some money that I'd raised for myself. Well, I must say that they look like a much higher priced item, so you obviously have a knack for this. Um, well done. <laughs> Thank you um, very much. What what kind of uh, reaction had you ha- have you had from people who have seen your films? Um, you know, there's there's a uh, I of course take all the best favorable emails I've ever gotten and post them on my testimonial page. And there's some really, I mean, there's a few that just bring tears to my eyes when I read them out of gratitude because, you know, they've, they've touched people at such a deep level. Um, and that's always rewarding. Of course, that never gets old. Um, it's funny, the reaction that I've gotten from beyond belief from Christians is almost identical to the reaction I've gotten from beyond reason from the scientific community. I mean, if you didn't know any better and if you swapped out some of their choice words, um, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a Christian and a scientist. And, and they're, it's funny. It's hilarious. Their, their arguments are almost identical. Uh, and, um, you know, I've heard from a lot of, um, you know, people who had grown up, grown up with different uh, Christian religions and, and, had sort of uh, thrown out the baby with the bathwater, as they say, and and found my film to be really comforting and and awakening because they they I think there was probably a deep guilt or remorse for having left the church, whatever church they were in, and when they saw my film, it was like you know I was like oh okay this this makes complete sense. Um, I have yet to hear from one Christian, you know, sort of like a fundamentalist, born again kind of type. Who's watched my film and said, "Oh, you know, I think you're onto something." <laughs> <laughs> they they don't like me very much, uh-huh. um, and probably the same thing with the scientific community. You know, they they just they're they're stuck in their dogma. I mean, the dogma of science, like you say, is is very similar to the dogma of of religions. And once people are, are sort of incarcerated in their own belief system, it's very hard for them to break free of it. You know, you know, for 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 them, it would be somewhat akin to admitting they've been living a lie. And nobody really wants to do that. You know, we live in such a black and white society. I'm right, you're wrong, or that you know, there's there's no middle ground. And what we are trying to do, I think, as as uh, messengers of a new consciousness, is getting people to say it's okay to to be where you are let's go beyond it's like Rumi said beyond all notions of right and wrong there's a field I'll meet you there (laughs) we don't have to feel that we were wrong it was just a stepping stone on our evolutionary path and now we're looking at a higher truth that unites everything that came before it doesn't have to make anyone wrong it's just opening to a greater understanding, a greater reality. And I really think that your film series invites us to do that. So I'm, I'm, I really honor you for that, Frank. Uh, again, thank you very much for the, for the uh, kind words. I've, uh, it, it doesn't get old. And, uh, you know, I tried my best not to be preachy, not to, uh, you know, try to say this is how it is. I, I, I make an effort to... You know, to leave things as a wonder, say, "Oh, look at this! This is this and this interesting." And um, the 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 case is made actually in both of the of my last two films that that when and this applies to really all religions, but I think specifically to Christianity, that when people uh, take on meditation and they they start to look at Vedanta and they understand it, and they just you know again take it. Be a scientist about it. I mean, the the best scientist is someone with a really, really healthy skepticism. You know, you can't be just completely open-minded and gullible and believe everything you hear. You have to be able to conduct the experimentation, say, well, you know, that's I that doesn't sound right at all, but you know what? I'm I'm open to the possibility that it is right and I'm going to explore and find out. 
Mm-hmm. And when you do that, and when you, you when you learn to meditate, and you begin to have these experiences, and then you go back, and from that new understanding, from that new new approach, that new perspective you have, then when you go back and explore the Bible, it's a thousand times richer. It's not, you know, it's exactly what you're saying. It's not really saying, oh no, the Bible's wrong. You're wrong for being a Christian. Um, you know, this is all lies. It's no. Take a look at this. Learn when Jesus said, "Seek the truth; it'll set you free." Or the kingdom of heaven is within you. You know, when you actually go do those in a practical level through your own spiritual experiences and practices, and then go and read the Bible, the 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 Temple on the Mount or the uh, Sermon on the Mount, all this stuff has such deeper uh, meaning for everybody. And I think the key here is actually looking within, trusting your inner guidance rather than being led by external dogma, where, where you know, the, the, the kind of rational shutters come down. You're not allowed to probe beyond what they tell you. Mm-hmm. Anyway. This is, yeah, this is... This is this is what the films all try to say, basically that same thing in a hundred different ways. Yeah. So um, your activities as a filmmaker certainly don't make a living for you. How do you make a living? Oh, well, um, I don't. Uh, <laughs> how do they prov- uh, how does the universe provide for you? So, um, and I do lots of things like, uh, I mean, over the years, the way I did my films, I had a, uh, uh, a pizza restaurant in California for a while that, that served Indian pizza. Um, I invented Skype. I mean, <laughs> we try to get your mind around that. You know, the same guy who invented Skype actually went off and did these films all by himself. Um, I've invented a team sport that's based with a Frisbee, um, which, of course, is phenomenal. Um, and there's no ego there. That's just kind of my approach to life. Um, I, I, uh, let me shift gears a little bit here. Uh, 11 years ago when I decided to, you know, undertake um, meditation and spirituality in a, in a rigorous fashion, um, it started, I mean, I'd read Eckhart Tolle's Power of Now a dozen years ago and had been reading the, uh, these kinds of books and I stumbled across something called The Art of Living um, in 2003, uh, which is right now a, a huge global phenomenon. And it's uh, something I hi- highly recommend for people to look at, artofliving.org. Oh, I second that. Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. Right. Um, yeah. So I'm right now. And I had – so Sri Sri, I mean, how humbling is this? Sri Sri has watched my films and he loves them. Mm. I mean, it's not every day that you get a chance to actually make documentary films on spirituality, show them to an enlightened master and have him. I mean, he, I sent Beyond Me to him when I, as soon as I finished it. And, uh, he, he replied, his secretary replied with a few comments, uh, you know, really minor technical things, really, but all the knowledge, uh, that's in that film mm-hmm. has been, has been blessed by him. Like he didn't say one thing about well no Frank you got this wrong and they changed no no he he left it completely intact which is uh, like I said extraordinarily humbling and uh, I gave him uh, Beyond Belief in Germany uh, in 2012 and then he asked me to join the foundation full time so right now I'm living on the Art of Living ashram in Boone North Carolina. Oh. So, right. So he just said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to make films. I want to continue making documentary films. He said, well, come join the movement. Um, so I'm living here. Uh, we got three inches of snow yesterday, but we're not socked in like Atlanta. Um, and it's beautiful here. I never, North Carolina was never on my radar at all, but it's an amazing place to live up here in the mountains. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm on staff here. I've, I've started an organic farm. I've invented a, a, uh, a negative carbon footprint greenhouse heating, heating system that I'm going to be implementing this summer. Um, I'm a cook here. I do laundry. I do all kinds of stuff. The thought of Indian pizza is intriguing. <laughs> what goes on that? You know, uh, this is my own, um, uh, sort of invention, I guess. Um, I mean, a lot of people, when they hear Indian pizza, or there's places you can buy it, and it's sort of like a masala pizza or a curry pizza, and uh, that's not what mine is. Basically, what I uh, 
you know, attempted to do, and I, I do this, I still have, I um, mean, we have a commercial pizza oven here at the ashram and everybody loves when, when it's Frank's pizza night. I mean, it's, it's, it's an experience. It's not just a meal to tell you the truth. <laughs> it's great. It, and that never gets old. I mean, you know, that it's, it's got a great time. But what I do is I, I basically distilled out all the different Indian flavorings. Um, and it's a much more subtle, refined, uh, experience. And so, and then I'll have a lot of toppings that I'll choose from when I'm cooking the pizzas. And every topping will have a little bit of a different flavor on it. Um, you know, the, the, the zucchini might have cumin powder on it. The potatoes might have turmeric, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, you know, when you, when you have the pizza, it's not just being like overwhelmed with, like I said, curry powder. It's, it's much more subtle than that. Um, <laughs> Well, it was fun. I mean, having the experience in California with the restaurant was uh, like having a party that never ended. I mean, the the, the pizza was, uh, we were selling out, I think we were profitable after four weeks, wow. which is which is basically impossible in the restaurant business, as you well know. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just a lot of fun. I mean, people, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been on a spiritual weekend silence retreat or uh, anything, but, um, you know, usually people after a, a, a retreat like that are kind of beaming. That's how people, I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. That's how people look <laughs> all the time in my restaurant. Just well, this huge. Uh, funnily enough, I'm actually a partner in a pizza, um, uh, business. So <laughs> we'll, we'll have to pick your brain Yeah. anyway. Um, so your next project is beyond thought. Uh, that my next film, right. Film. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm working on all kinds of projects at once, um, and this ashram is a huge undertaking. I mean, Absolutely. it's it's a uh, it's a fantastic. It was constructed by Maharishi uh, Mahesh Yogi's TM group about 20 years ago, and we basically it was a fixer upper ashram. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a fantastic place. The meditation hall is huge. I mean, it's up on top of the mountain. You would just, you would be blown away. We've got an Ayurvedic uh, spa here with uh, Shiradhara and Abhyanga treatments. I mean, it's a fantastic facility. And, does it uh, have a website? Does it have what? A oh, website. the website? Yeah, it does. Artofretreatcenter.org, I believe, is, is our personal uh, website, although we're still uh developing i mean that site will take you to our own page on the corporate art of living site uh -huh. but we're in the middle of developing our own uh, you know our full blown site for this for this well this frank i'm going to have to follow your career it sounds like you are a modern day renaissance man and and uh it's been a delight speaking with you we've been speaking with frank huguenard who is the producer uh, director writer creator of beyond me, Beyond Belief, and Beyond Reason film series, soon to be followed by a fourth younger sibling. Um, Frank, give us again your website. Sure. And, uh, you know, if you watch my films, you want to drop me a line and uh, or talk on the phone, I'm usually pretty free to do that. The website's beyondmefilm.com, or if you just Google Beyond Me Frank, you can find it. And uh, you find me on Facebook, and that's about it. Terrific. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Miriam.